Greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ. So this time of year, a lot of Christians have questions about holiday participation, and a growing number of Christians are also participating in biblical holidays, which brings up debates about celebrating Hanukkah. I'm going to explore this surprisingly nuanced topic and share with you some information I've discovered that nobody is talking about, but is really at the heart of the matter. And I'm also going to share with you a message I just received today from the Holy Spirit. So let's begin. Most people are familiar with Hanukkah and some of the associated customs, such as the dreidels, the potato pancakes called latkes, the golden chocolate coins known as gelt. And most of all, Hanukkah is known for its eight day menorah candle lighting ceremony. This is said to commemorate a miracle after the Israelites reclaimed the temple from Greek forces and there was said to only be enough oil to light the menorah for one night, but it miraculously lasted for eight nights. Interestingly, the only mention of Hanukkah, also known as the Feast of Dedication, in the Bible is found in the New Testament. John 10, to 23 reads, And it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of the Dedication, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. So we know the feast was celebrated in Jesus' time and that Jesus himself was at the temple during the celebration. Uh, some have argued that Jesus' presence at the temple during the Feast of Dedication does not necessarily mean that he approved of it, but that argument is weak. Jesus was very protective of his father's house and would not have been reticent to speak up if anything about the ceremony was offensive to God. There is certainly no mention of him causing an uproar over the feast itself, so we can logically assume that this was an accepted temple practice. That right there is enough for some Christians to give their blessing to the holiday. However, there is so much more you need to know. Remember, Jesus presumably approved of the Feast of Dedication and how it was observed during his time. However, now we must answer the question of how was it observed at that time and has the holiday changed since then? Let's take a brief look at the origins of the holiday, which commemorates the retaking of the temple following the Maccabean Revolt. The Maccabean Revolt was a Jewish rebellion led by the Maccabees against the Seleucid Empire and against Hellenistic influence on Jewish life. King Antichus IV Epiphanes launched a massive campaign of repression against the Jewish customs in 168 BC. Jewish practices were banned, Jerusalem was placed under direct control, and the temple in Jerusalem was made the site of a pagan cult. This repression triggered a revolt and Maccabee and his family led the rebels, who all became known as the Maccabees, and their actions would later be chronicled in the apocryphal books of 1st Maccabees and 2nd Maccabees. Uh, the Jews did prevail in the subsequent cleansing of the temple and rededication of the temple on the 25th of Kislev is the source of the festival of Hanukkah. Interestingly, neither 1st nor 2nd Maccabees makes mention of the oil miracle. Remember, today the lighting of the menorah to commemorate the miracle of the oil is the centerpiece of the entire festival. The famous Jewish historian Josephus adds more questions to the origin of this tradition with his writings about attending the Feast of Dedication during the 1st century AD. Josephus writes, and from that time to this, we celebrate this festival and call it Lights. I suppose the reason for this is because this liberty beyond our hopes appeared onto us, and that thence the name was given to this festival. This is very curious indeed. Josephus admits he doesn't know why it's called the Festival of Lights, and his speculation for the reason seems fairly weak. Surely if it was celebrated with a large nine-armed menorah with 44 candles lit over eight nights, he wouldn't speculate as to why it's called the Festival of Lights. As previously mentioned, the two books of Maccabees also do not mention it. So where does the story of the oil miracle come from? Well, you have to fast forward 400 years past the earthly life of Jesus and 600 plus years after the actual Maccabean revolt to find the story written in the Talmud. 
That's right, the modern-day observance of Hanukkah is largely based off Talmudic records, as well as later editions, as we will see. The fact it is found in the Talmud is enough for many Christians to dismiss it. However, hold on, because there is so much more we need to understand first. So the Talmud is a mixture of truth and lies. It contains polemics against Jesus, and it is the furthest thing from a reliable Christian source in regards to doctrine. However, the historical records are another story. At least some, if not most, of the historical accounts are true. For a good example, see the video I did called The Crimson Thread, Evidence of Jesus. Our Lord confirmed with me the truth of the supernatural troubles that occurred at the temple in Jerusalem following the crucifixion of Christ, which were actually recorded in the Talmud. The video is a very powerful piece of extra-biblical evidence for Jesus, and a wonderful true story about our Lord and first century Jerusalem that few people have heard. I do recommend you watch it and share it, and I will provide a link to it at the end of this video. In regards to Hanukkah, let's dive deeper into its current form of observance, a tradition that appears to have emerged centuries after the event. Hanukkah is celebrated each year in December. This is also the time of the winter solstice, the darkest days of the calendar year. This takes place just before the return of longer days, and as a result, many pagan sun gods are celebrated around this time. Because of this, many people believe that Hanukkah's modern-day candlelight origins are rooted in this pagan celebration. According to my Jewish learning, Jews may have been capturing a pagan solstice festival that had won wide support among partially paganized Jews in order to make it a day of God's victory over paganism. Even the lighting of the candles for Hanukkah fits the context of the surrounding torchlight honors for the sun, end quote. We've seen the so-called Christianizing of the pagan festival of Saturnalia, so are we similarly seeing an example of Judaizing a pagan sun worship festival? I'm sure you'll want something more substantial than conjecture, so let's continue. Hanukkah begins with the lighting of the menorah candles at sundown. The first candle is known as the helper candle, also called the shamash. It is used to light the other candles, beginning with one other one on the first night and then an additional one each subsequent night until accumulating with eight lit candles plus the addition of the shamash on the final night. Let's talk about this curious little helper candle. Does it seem odd to you that this extra candle is included? Couldn't you just light the first candle and then use it to light the others and stick with eight candles since it is supposed to commemorate eight nights of light? And if you are going to use a helper candle, does it make sense to put it in the center and elevate it above the other candles? Do helpers sit in the throne position? And what does shamash mean anyway? We are told it is just a Hebrew word for attendant or helper, but does it have any other implications? Interestingly, the term shamash has historical significance beyond Hanukkah. In Mesopotamian religion, shamash was the god of the sun. As the solar deity, shamash represented light, justice, and equity. He was part of an astral triad of divinities, along with the moon god Sin and the goddess of Venus, Ishtar. So we have a false sun god that is also a member of a false trinity, don't go anywhere yet, it gets worse. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, Shamash is considered a member of the special class of Mesopotamian gods called the Anunnaki. As the solar deity, Shamash exercised the power of light over darkness and evil. In this capacity, he became known as the god of justice and equity and was the judge of both gods and men. Shamash was not only the god of justice, but also governor of the whole universe. In this aspect, he was pictured seated on a throne, holding in his hand the symbols of justice and righteousness, a staff and a ring. So we can see that Shamash is not only a pagan sun god of Mesopotamia, but also a false figure of God sitting on a throne. He has a staff, such as what Jesus carries, and he also judges people and the Elohim, the lesser Elohim. 
So now the next question we should ask about the Shamash candle is when did it originate? And this can clue us in on whether we are dealing with religious corruption or linguistic corruption. If, for instance, we discover the original Sumerian and Hebrew words were actually quite different from one another, and that it was a later English tradition that presented the words as the same, then that would be another story. However, this is not the case. The festival of Hanukkah was celebrated for more than a millennium before the word shamash was ever associated with it. The first written mention of a shamash light to kindle the other candles on the menorah did not appear until the 16th century. This shows that the Shamash is a relatively recent addition. It was not part of the festival that took place in the first century attended by Christ. Rather than a pagan tradition becoming Judaized, we may actually be witnessing a rabbinical Judaism tradition becoming paganized. Keep in mind, Mesopotamia was located in the area of modern-day Iraq between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, so this was right in Israel's backyard. We have a Mesopotamian sun god who's placed in the center and above a series of eight candles that are supposed to represent the true God Almighty. I will repeat, the Shamash, which is the name of the Sumerian sun god, is the first candle lit each night and it is placed in the center and above as if ruling over eight candles that are supposed to represent a miracle of our true God Almighty. And all of this takes place in December before the winter solstice, at a time of year when all the fake sun deities are ceremonially honored. And remember this tradition of placing a so-called helper candle in the center and above the rest was started in the 16th century by rabbinical Jews with possible surrounding pagan influence. So this ceremony has changed quite a bit from the time that Jesus attended the Feast of Dedication. I don't know about you, but our family will not be partaking in the candle lighting ceremony, and we are not going to let anything called shamash anywhere near our home. Now, I said at the beginning, the answer was yes and no to whether Christians should celebrate Hanukkah. You have now seen the strong case for no, so what is the case for yes? If we acknowledge the aspects of the Feast of Dedication that were present in Jesus' day, then it can be a fun opportunity to share the story of the Maccabean Revolt and the rededication of the Temple, which is a true historical event and one that was honored by Christ himself. Make sure your family members understand the books of Maccabees 1 and 2 are not part of the scripture canon, but they do still describe an actual event. You can also read all about what Jesus said to the Pharisees the day he attended the temple while this event was going on in the book of John. All this can be done without any candle lighting. The last big remaining question is, did the oil miracle actually take place? Unlike the addition of the Shamash, which was added in the 16th century, the oil miracle is recorded much earlier in the 5th century. I know from direct Holy Spirit revelation that at least some of the miracles recorded in the Talmud did actually take place. Could this be another one? It does seem strange that Josephus and both the books of Maccabees failed to mention it. However, in light of, and yes, pun intended, in light of all the miracles God did for Israel, the oil story could be considered a very minor one. It is possible it happened and was passed down by oral tradition, but not well known or emphasized, since the retaking of the temple was originally the crux of the story. The lampstand lit may be emphasized more strongly today in order to justify the lighting of the shamash candle. In discerning the fruit, the story of the oil itself, rather taken as true or allegorical, confirms our God as a God of miracles, one who can keep our light burning well beyond our own means of what we think is possible. Is there a lesson for us today? As we enter an end times period of much tribulation, the book of Revelations tells us the man of sin will wear out the saints. If you ever feel like you only have enough oil, which represents our faith, to endure for a, one day or one year, but you need to endure for seven or eight or even more, 
then you can pray to our Father in heaven, the God of miracles, who can and will make that oil last. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. The oil miracle took place in the temple, and we now are the temples of God. Yes, he will perform many oil miracles in us, his temples, during these last days. I have Holy Spirit confirmation of this today. Hallelujah. Go ahead and let me know in the comments what you and your family are going to do this Hanukkah. I pray for peace and blessings to you and yours, however you decide to celebrate or not to celebrate this Hanukkah season.